Welcome to Ask the Experts. I'm Jill Schlesinger, editor-at-large, CBSMoneyWatch.com, and I'm joined by... Jack Otter, executive editor of CBSMoneyWatch.com. What's so good is that now that I have you do your own intro, I don't have to remember you what You don't have to remember anymore, is. and you probably just finally got it. I did finally And now you don't it. do it, yeah. Jack, uh, we have a special guest in the studio today. Indeed we do. it's a big jobs week. woo And uh, today we got some very weird divergent information about jobs. ADP said 91,000 jobs created in the private sector. And so, our guest is responsible for 89,000 uh, of those 80, 91. <laughs> yeah. 89 and a half. Yeah. 89,000 and a half. And then Challenger Gray and Christmas said, actually, there's going to be a whole new round of cuts that, that companies are going to make, 116,000. So divergent information just two days <laughs> before the big employment report. So we had to bring on a job networking queen. And without further ado... We invite you to meet Michelle Tillis Lederman. No, Letterman. <laughs> I just wanted to meet if you're here. Uh, Michelle Letterman is founder and CEO of Executive Essentials, which provides customized communication, team building, and leadership programs. You mean you get people out on those ropes courses? I haven't done the ropes, but I have brought ping pong balls and hula hoops and giant tinker toys to, to play with the companies. Really? Yeah. Is it like <laughs> an episode of The Office when that they go? That is so yeah. good. Yeah. That would be excellent. And Michelle, the thing that is totally cool about you is besides the fact that you apply all of what you've written, oh, in her 11 laws of likability, um, but you also are using this in the workforce and you're trying to help people figure out Absolutely. how to better package themselves and how to really prepare for a brand new employment landscape. So what are you seeing out there in the workforce? What do you know from people? And are people kind of like anxious and worried or are they feeling happy they have jobs? Where are people right now? There has been a big shift in how long it takes somebody to do that job transition. And so I'm hearing a lot about those career changers and people who are either dissatisfied internally but don't want to make a move because of the uh, uncertainty of the job market. And so they're trying to figure out internally, how do I continue to grow those skills? Mm -hmm. And that's hard to do. I mean, especially uh, people of a certain age, right? Per if you get to a certain seasoned place <laughs> in your profession, Jack, they might call Andy it Andy Rooney? You were talking at that level? Well, <laughs> I mean... I don't know what to say about that. We love you, Andy, but wow. I hope I don't have to work that long. Um, Michelle, when you go in and you do seminars or you're doing your work with all of your big-time clients like J.P. Morgan Chase and Morgan Stanley and Museum of Modern Art. That's a fun uh, one. Uh, <laughs> what is it that you see out in that, that people really need to be thinking about going through their, you know, like career transitions, but just people who are happy with the, the place they're, where they are, but they want to make sure they keep rising or they or even people trying to break into those places? People really don't give enough attention to their relationships. You know, they if they're happy, they think, okay, I'm just going to keep going with the status quo, and they don't really spend that time continuing to give value and invest in the relationships that will be there as those changes happen and when they need them. People tend to think about networking for a need or networking for now, and they don't think long-term in that. And so we're not spending the time, whether it's internally or externally, um, you know, getting out there and just having those conversations and most importantly following up on those conversations now jack knows that i love networking oh. i don't call it networking i just Good. call it schmoozing i mean i'm i am a voyeur i like to like i'm sort of interested in what other people do and i am and let it be said because jill probably won't say this she's outstanding at it she's incredible <laughs> i love that it comes naturally, <laughs> your I bottle think. of yeah. will come uh, later good, um, <laughs> it's your sales background yes ex well that is part of it because i grew up in a business and where really yes it's important that you're really smart and you know how to manage money but people don't hand their money over to you unless oh, yeah. they really like you so and, true and so what i kind of learned was that i never thought i'd be a good salesperson because i was a trader and so we didn't have very good relationship <laughs> skills. <laughs> but what I did learn is that, you know, hey, I actually like people, and I'm interested in their stories. And what um, I think is always missing in the networking piece is that mm -hmm. it always seems uh, unilateral. Like, it shouldn't – in other words, when people come and try to network with me, I think, all right, that's kind of nice. Like, you want to make a connection. But don't you want to be able to say, tell me what you could do for me and then I can do for you? I, I love so many things that you've said. I love that you call it schmoozing because I always say relationship networking is just another way to say making friends. Right. And you are living one of the laws, which is the law of curiosity. You are going out there and just being curious and asking some open questions and finding out about people. And that's where the true connections will come because you're genuinely interested. And as you have, what you're looking for is a reciprocal exchange, not that unilateral, that one-way interrogation. Yeah. 
you're looking to intersperse that questioning and that interest with a little self-disclosure. Let me share a little bit about myself, and then we can find those places of commonality and connection and interest. And Jack, and that, you know, uh, you just, say, that's the important thing about starting before you need it. Right. Because mm-hmm. when you don't actually need anything, then you're much more approachable than when it's I want, I want. And I'm wondering from your perspective, like as a journalist, I mean, you obviously have natural curiosity. Did you kind of network with the people you were covering or like how did that work for you? Uh, well, it's funny. My job history is a history of networking successes. Really? And I don't like networking. I don't feel like I'm very good at it. I force myself to do it. And yet, you know, after the first job by sending out 10,000 resumes in the previous recession, um, they just started like, uh, my, my mother bumped into someone at a grocery store who worked at a newspaper where I'd applied. <laughs> that was job number two. Job number three was because I agreed to speak on a panel on ethics. One of the other panelists had an opening. Boom. So it's, it's all been stuff like that. Um, this job I got because I went on an interview and they immediately... Um, like did pull the bait and switch on me and said, oh, well, actually, we don't have that job. We have this other one. <laughs> and I had a quick thinking, like, I'd like to tell them something, but yeah. I'm not. I'm going to smile and I'm going to have a great time and we're going to send a nice follow-up letter, blah, blah, blah. And four years later, you know, the guy I spoke to was somewhere else and I ended up here as a result That's of that. That's so, so interesting. Um, so it's so true. Oh, and Facebook, um, four or five days after I joined Facebook for the first time, yeah. a guy reached out to me. We had a little back and forth. He offered me a job. I was that close to taking it. My old place ended up giving me a contract to keep me so I wouldn't go to him. And then when they folded my magazine, that contract was my parachute until I found something new. So it's so true about networking. And I've got friends who they'll be online looking at job postings. And I just say, stop it. Shut off Mm. the computer. Nobody gets a job that way, especially in a recession when 20 other million people, 20 million people are sending their resumes to that same spot. How do you... Like, do you do something on an ongoing basis right now? I mean, what do you what do you do to look? What would you give it's advice to Jack? Because Jack has a job. He's right. a big shot. He's a big kahuna <laughs> here, right? And you know, and he's happy, very happy. If you're watching, yeah, right. the right people are watching. Never been happier. But, but how does he? How does someone like this keep building that networking? Um, pattern, and and he doesn't love to do it, but Mm -hmm. what would you tell him to do? I actually want to come to that point that you say you don't love it and you're not good at it, and um, poppycock. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent word. (laughs) Megan, the producer, is smiling. She's loving that. I said dastardly yesterday, and you beat me with (laughs) poppycock. Excellent. (laughs) I was thinking hogwash, but... All right, so... Yeah, (laughs) love that one, too. (laughs) My feeling is... You are judging yourself and how you network because you're comparing yourself to Jill, who might be just so animated and, and, and loves it and feeds off of that energy. So that might not be the energy that you bring to networking, but you bring different skills. And so you mm. might bring uh, a real strength in listening and in finding a deeper connection with that one person rather than getting to meet five or ten. That's great. Okay, I'll buy that. Yeah, I like <laughs> yeah, de- sure, and yeah. the, de- the depth of the connection is important also because, yeah. you know, all these people have like 5,000 acquaintances and don't do anything for them. So like, sure. oh, it's great, but uh, no one will actually pick up the phone or make a, a, an introduction for you. It's so true. Those aren't real connections. And all the stories that you said about how you got the jobs, I can give you another, an, another list of them myself and, and clients. And it does come, I think. The current survey says 45% of all jobs come from networking. 90% wow. on the executive level come from networking. Wow. Yeah. wow. So That's depending amazing. on where you are in your career, it is really, as they say, who you know. You now, know speaking of depth versus shallow, I've heard that you can have too many friends on LinkedIn. I'm not at this level, but I've certainly <laughs> seen people. And you're thinking, they don't know everyone. They don't know half of those people. Well, what, do you have a, a theory well, on that? Well, you do. That's <laughs> different because you're like Dolly Levi. You're supposed to know all those people. It's your job. But like re- regular people, by the way, I'm not on LinkedIn, which is scary. Wow. It's, it's bad, right? Yeah, but and then again, you don't need to. You're a ninja. There mm. is no yeah. bad. Okay, this is like what I want people to realize is that you do it your way. I'm, I'm going to steal the Burger King slogan. <laughs> if you have to find your own energy around networking and how you want to interact with people, whether it's on a social media site or if it's in person, if it's a one-on-one or in a group, and when you find the way in which you feel you can bring your best self to it, then you'll do it because you enjoy it. But what if you don't actually, all right, let's just start here. What if you don't feel like you have a network? Like Megan is, wrote this question for me, but it's a brilliant question. Megan, thank mm-hmm. you. Uh, but, you know, especially if you're young and you're starting out mm-hmm. or you've been in the same place for a while and you didn't really know how to network, like how do you get, what are the steps that people should take? So there's two ways to think about a network. You, everyone has a network. You went to school with people. You went to camp with people. Whatever other places that you've interacted with through your whole life, you have a network. 
Mm. Unless you have never left your house, <laughs> you have a network. <laughs> so we want to just continue to nurture the network that we have and expand that network in different ways. I really am against the who I should know mm. versus who I want to know. Right. Because that's when it starts to get that icky, yucky feeling around networking that everyone <laughs> says, oh, it's so manipulative. No. If you just are out there meeting people, so for example, LinkedIn, here's a recent story. Guy was in a uh, photography group. He was networking. He was in a group that he had an interest in, and he would actually you know, comment and answer questions and answer questions, and he ended up going out to do a photography shoot with somebody else in the group, and inevitably the what do you do question came up, and, and one guy said, well, I'm the CEO of this company, and this is what we do. What do you do? He said, well, I do the same thing. I'm just unemployed right now. The next thing out of his mouth was, you want a job? <gasps> wow. I like that story. I got shivers. I thought you were going to say they started dating, which, is <laughs> bit of the better, which I'm kind of bummed about. But okay, this is good. We're talking about jobs. But he had a job by the end of that shoot. And wow. it was because he was in a photography group. So do the things that you want to do. I was sharing before we started that I met my husband swing dancing. Oh. Huh? And I went out and... Do you know how to swing dance? Because if we could get this on camera right now... This oh, no. <laughs> uh, actually, before, right before we got married, we took some lessons and let's just say I was going to need a lot of lessons. Uh -huh. But you know what killed me was, it was I think it was not for people who were about to get married. It was for dating, for meeting people. Um, so you kept on switching partners. So I was like, okay, I figured out how to do the short girl. Oh, now i got to figure out how to do the tall girl. Oh. Uh, and so, yeah, but you. we're planning. Once time frees up, Swing dancing. jitterbug. Yeah, jitterbug all dance. about yeah. it. Yeah. All right. So you do the things that you like to do. Mm -hmm. It leads to, thing, to, to perhaps building that network. What about... Um, Tell me a little bit about, like, when, when you say avoid the ones that you think you should have. Someone says to you, you ought to meet Joe Schmo. That's, <laughs> that's a little different. That's different, right? And, and I don't want to avoid anyone, but I don't want you to be so targeted as, okay, I'm going to push my way through all of you mm. to get to meet that one person. Oh, because all the people that you're walking past are probably the stronger connections and, and maybe where you might find the opportunities that you don't realize are there. And you're burning all those bridges to a certain extent. When, you could. When you start to... Piss them off with your attitude. Absolutely. Right. So, um, <laughs> if somebody, <laughs> if somebody, Jill, you've never done that. Never. I know. It. No. Oh my God, no, no never. No, no, because you made best friends with everyone along the way. Uh, no, but you know the 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 thing that's kind of funny about it is that I'm just laughing. I, I was I, the reason why, you know, I was in um, w when I used to be an investment advisor. You know, you meet a lot of people who come into your office. They may not even hire you. And uh, I remember actually being in the grocery store once, and <laughs> this woman came up to me and said. Oh, you know, I, I, I don't know if you remember me. And I literally, I couldn't remember her name. I'm like, oh, yeah, you have $900,000 in the Fidelity <laughs> funds. And she's like, a little quieter. Okay, that's a little bit, uh, all right, that's a little, but it was funny. We started talking and she said, I'm always, I was always sorry that we didn't come to, to, we didn't, you know, come to you guys to manage our money. And I said, well, why not now? And she says, well, I don't know. Why not? And then she literally booked an appointment the next day. But she came back and she told me something that was interesting because we were, we were, she was actually uh, referred to me. And she said she felt a little bit too close, like there were too many of her friends who oh. used us as advisors, and she thought that was a little bit weird. And then as we got bigger and bigger, it didn't seem like as a, as, as a major uh, contention. But that networking thing, I felt, always felt like, like worked against me. Like I knew her because she joined the, you know, the temple where I belonged. And that was also like a little bit weird. And you know what I mean? It's like hanging out with your doctor. Well, you're, yeah. you're in a different world because money has a whole different personality um, and dynamic in a relationship. Yeah. If you take out of it all the things that brought those people to you are the right ways in which to network because right. it's natural. And the foundation of likability is trust. And especially in, in a field of money, trust is critical. Now, how do you feel about the kind of disclosing of yourself? Because I am a hyper discloser. Like I will tell anybody anything. They just ask me the question. They'll we'll get do along that. great. Okay. But, yeah. but there, but you know, you should hold some things back. And I've learned that. In, in but but there's that. It always felt like that the trust was built because I could be open, mm -hmm. and then the person responds to that. But is there too much information to divulge to your networking? Oh, there's always a little bit of that CMI. Yeah, uh, <laughs> got to talk in text lingo now. Yeah. Um, Here's what I would say is you want to follow the lead of the other person. So match a little bit around how much they're willing to disclose. But vulnerability equals credibility. Hmm. And, and think about that. Because if you're willing to show a little bit of that vulnerability, that openness, there's authenticity to that. People trust it. They think it's real and that you're not just putting on a happy face or acting or 
uh, in this mass. Right. Well, it's funny. We have an article on MoneyWatch.com. It's called The Six Things You Should Never Do on Twitter or Facebook. And one of them, I always like the first one, which is don't be a job search bore. But I actually use a different word that rhymes with bore. <laughs> it seems much more interesting to me. The other is don't be too stiff, which is if you're a little too guarded, then people never really yeah. get to know who you are, right? Well, you know, it's really true. I started my whole social media campaign July 1st. I mean, I'm new to the, I guess, business side of Twitter and and, uh, and Facebook. And as I started to do it, I thought, okay, I'm going to give them tips and I'm going to give advice and I'm going to do all this job-related stuff. And then I put all these pictures of me with animals because I love <laughs> doing animal rescue. And I have a picture of me holding a Siberian tiger and being kissed by a fox and that was who I am at my core and my passion, and I shared that with people. And I got more comments on those pictures than on any other thing I put up there. Huh. I, I can see that. I, I, do I don't have any Facebook friends with Siberian tigers. So. <laughs> I know. Well, yeah. Do you put personal stuff on your Facebook page or not? I, the way I do it is I try to keep Facebook a little more personal, LinkedIn a little more professional. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, you know, I think it, it, it really depends. Um, I mean, we're in the, in, the, in the network news business, and so some of our colleagues obviously are internationally known, and apparently you can actually have two Facebook pages, sort yes. of your surface one, right. where you can have a million friends that we talked about, and that's okay, and then your personal one is buried a little deeper, and, and so you can actually do both. Well, I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think it is a little bit weird. I, I, mean, I don't, I'm, you know, I'm a reluctant Facebook user, so I really just use it and post things about work stuff, mm -hmm. and... Uh, you know, my niece is like, oh, your Facebook page is so boring, <laughs> you know, so I, but I don't know, it's a little bit icky. I think there is certainly a an, an age thing going on here. I mean, we, we often give advice to, to young people, you know, that picture of you at the fraternity party might not be the best idea yeah, right. when you're going out looking for jobs. Um, and so, I, but I think in that, you know, they share everything. I mean, I, I sound very old saying that, uh, but it's true. I mean, I'm a little uncomfortable with some of the things now where automatically on Facebook, everything you read you know, you share with everyone else. Um, it, you know, there is a lot so of much. lack of privacy. Yeah. Oh, and I, and I agree with what you said. A little, um, Each of the sites, there's over 2,000 social media sites, but I talk about the top three, LinkedIn, yeah. Twitter, and Facebook, and they do have their own personalities. And I started like you where I had Facebook as my friends and LinkedIn was professional. But when you do business with people you like, sometimes those lines get blurred. And they really did get blurred for me. And so I did put out that second page, which is my professional page, which people can like but not friend, and it's all uh. very confusing. So I'm sitting uh, teaching a class at NYU one day, and I had made my site open to my network, not just my friends. you got to be really careful because one of my students goes, love that 80s hair, professor. <laughs> and I said, huh? I mean, I was a deer in the headlights. I... I think all the color drained out of my face and immediately went home and, you know, I'm like, okay, friends only. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Hey, if you've got a question for Michelle Lip, I keep trying to say the other way because you know what? You spell it the same way. And I, I asked know. you before. I Letterman. tell my husband it should be that way. Letterman. <laughs> um, let's know. So hop onto moneywatch.com and let's see if there's anyone, you know, doing anything interesting in the chat room. You can just shoot us an email. Um, ask the experts at moneywatch.com. Here is one from Vanna. <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny if it were Vanna White? Yeah. Because listen to the question: What is the best way to improve my network? <laughs> Turn your letters faster. <laughs> no. um, and how to you? How would I use social media to increase my network? I actually think social media is a great tool. Uh, it's just one other means. You don't want to over rely on it. But think about on, on LinkedIn. How it, might you use it? You can join, as we said before, some of the hobbyist groups as well as industry groups. Every once in a while, you might answer a question. You don't want to have your name on every single LinkedIn network update because then you become that bore with a rhyme, mm. right? <laughs> on, and, and you get really in somebody's face. You don't want to be in their face. You just want to be in their circle. You want to increase your familiarity, which is one of our laws of likability. When you kind of hear somebody come in and out, you build that trust and that recognition and people come to front of mind. So I love Facebook for the instant chat. You see who's online and you just do a quick hello. Hey, I saw you're on there. How's it going? Uh, I might, if I see somebody change their uh, employment status or their title, I might drop a little congratulations, what are you doing now? And so it's light touches is a way that you can mm -hmm. use social media to kind of keep in their mind but not harass them because email actually becomes a burden. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. I had a guy from high school who, um, I, but like my biggest network in, in my in Facebook is like my college classmates and my high school classmates. My high school classmates seem to be way more into it. <laughs> I think there's like this 
really weird obsession with finding what your ex from high school is doing. <laughs> but that's sure. just part of it for I me. I get that. <laughs> um, so it was, but it was interesting because this guy basically said to me, you know, uh, can I send you something? You know, because I had this idea. And I was like, all right. And, you know, <laughs> he sent me an email. And it is sort of sitting in my inbox and, and, and toying with me right now. And I know I really need to respond. I need to do something with it. Uh, and it's probably not even a bad idea. It's just mm-hmm. that all of a sudden now it's become a burden. It's uncomfortable. Yeah, a little bit. So let me give some advice to those people that want to make that request. It's hard to ask. And so on, on both sides of the table, it's hard to sometimes get the request and know how to field it. When you ask somebody for something, give them an easy out. Mm-hmm. So if he's saying, you know, I don't know if this idea is a good fit for your show or if this is of interest to you. So he's giving you a way to respond saying it's really not a fit, <laughs> you know, and, and it's okay. Right. And then for the person who's receiving that request for you who's sitting there going, oh, this is a little uncomfortable, right? If you decide that no is the answer, it could be um, no, however, you may look into this or this might be a better fit. Why don't you research that? Or mm-hmm. if you know somebody there, you can ask permission of that other person to make an introduction if you think the idea is worth it. Got it. So you can decide on what level or extent you want to um, help them move forward past you. And and you know what's so funny about that? I'm wondering, Jack, if like, it, do you feel that way sometimes about PR pitches? Oh, of that course, we get? Yeah. You know, But then you think, like, I got to read them because there could be something interesting here. I used to think that. And then the, the, the mass, they're so massive. They're, I mean, there's so many of them. And the problem is that... Well, so many PR people, they don't bother to think about whether your um, right. your outlet is proper for their news. Mm. They just they literally send it to every email address they can find. And so, so much stuff piles in. I actually delete a lot of stuff without ever reading it. Uh, I know there's certain good ones, and there's certain people who actually don't use the scattershot approach. And so mm-hmm. I will check out what they have to say because it's, it's usually valuable. Victoria asks, she's uh, in the chat room at moneywatch.com if you want to join the chat. What's a compelling intro question or statement? First impressions count, she oh, says. Oh, yes. It's first... true, right? So I would say, Jack, you're looking very tired today. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that. But what is you a first way to, uh, like, you want to, re- let's assume that you have no connection mm-hmm. with somebody and you just want to try to make a connection. How do, what, you know, subject line, what do you want right. to put? Uh, I love what she said, that first impressions count. You have about 90 seconds. This is anecdotal. There's been loads of different uh, studies on how long it takes somebody to make that assessment about you. But uh, you hear 90 seconds come up again and again. Mm. And so what do you do in that first 90 seconds? Most important, smile. (laughs) That's good. Smile. And some good eye contact. And then I want you to look around the environment in which you're in. There is a whole chapter that is going to give you lots of ideas of places to start conversation. But one of the best places is to look around. Do I see a poster of, of you know, a sports team that I'm into or that I'm not into? And, and then we can start talking sports. Do you see a, a picture of kids? Do you see um, that well, you're just at a speaker or how was the dinner or whatever it might be? There's always information around that environment. There's nothing wrong with using the tried and true, you know, something about the weather or something about how you got there and travel. Because sometimes you just need to get it started. And I was talking to somebody today who struggles with starting a conversation. And I said, here's the thing. We all are there, and it's not all on you. Mm-hmm. The other person is there, and as they come in, and, and, and they want to make it work, too. Maybe. Because you don't know that, right? <laughs> That's true. But most... well, you got to get a curmudgeon. Right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's true. I had one I mean, of those recently, yeah. And it's like, yeah. ooh, okay. that yeah. kind of hurts, yeah. all right? Uh, ouch. But... There's a great challenge. You get a curmudgeon, your challenge is how to figure out how to make them smile. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Yeah. I like can, that. Can you change somebody's day? And you can. By just... I feel so empowered right now. <laughs> it's all coursing I mean, through. I'm getting off the bus this morning and uh, coming into Port Authority, and I turned and I looked at the bus driver's face and caught his eye, and I said, you have a great day. And he said, thank you, young lady. And I, lo- I love the young, I yeah, love the young yeah, lady. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're all right. for that. You're all for that. I love <laughs> it. But you f- I felt that he recognized that I actually was generally wishing that for him, and he felt that that was real. Versus, thanks, you know, have a good day. And you don't even look at them. Here's Jim. He's 67 years old. He's been retired for the last two years, but he wants to get back into work. Share your thoughts on how someone who's 67, he's got to have a vast network, but how to start. How to, and how do you say, you know, I retired, but maybe I made a mistake? Um, well, saying that doesn't have to be said to the workplace. You know, you can figure that out internally, and that's not something you need to talk about. Okay. You have so much to bring to that table, and you need to connect with the value you bring to an organization. You know what? Not, you know, people aren't staying 30 years in jobs anymore. 
I think the current graduate is going to have eight careers, not jobs, eight careers Wait, in their lifetime. Wow. I'm exhausted. Right? <laughs> I've had two and it's exhausting. I'm on like six or seven already. <laughs> so uh, there isn't that expectation that somebody's going to be there for just such a huge amount of time. At 67, you still got uh, you know a solid eight to ten years of really productive time. And you have the professional maturity where you might not need the level of training that some of the people that are coming out of school need. Interesting. So there is a bit of a trade-off in terms of productivity versus training. So you need to understand your value coming to the table. And as you are out there, really um, be very specific about what you're looking for. You might start with a little volunteering, a little, you know, this is fun, let me help out. And you might work your way in um, through more casual means rather than a strategic job search. Okay, I'm into it. Um, in the chat room, Dee wants to know, what's the best approach at trade shows and conferences? I think that to be the mo one of the most awkward things. I remember womaning the booth at uh, whatever, the, like the Rhode Island Business Expo. And, uh, oh, my God, like tackling people as they walk down the aisle. It mm. is so <laughs> horrifying. What is the way to break through that clutter? There is a, I've been to those, and, and you stand there with your cards, and you're standing on the line waiting to talk to somebody, and they're exhausted because they've talked to 20 people, and they, they're never going to remember you. Right. So, But you and I remember. <laughs> <laughs> so what would make you remember somebody? Think about that. Think about what you want to stand out for. Do you want to be that energetic one? Do you want to be the one who, uh, you know, you can have something visual about you. It could be a color. Don't go too old, right? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't want to necessarily stand up for negative reasons. <laughs> right. Oh, that hot pink one. I remember her. <laughs> uh, but when you get up there and you actually have that moment to talk, have a question that has some value to it. You might go onto Google and research a little bit about some of the companies that are going to be there. You might not hit every single company, but you might have some information about how the stock price is doing or um, some recent news, and you might ask a question. Now, here's where I caution you. If you sound too smart and you ask too tough a question, you don't want to make somebody else look stupid because they don't know the answer. Yeah. Right? You know, and yeah. what, well, how do you feel about uh, always avoiding those things whenever possible, <laughs> trying any other way to meet these companies? You know, as you said, they're tired. They're getting assaulted by people mm -hmm, with cards right. the whole time. I feel like those are sometimes the least productive. I mean, is there a way to... Okay, I don't, I've never seen you before. You're going back to another state. What's sort of the minimum I can do that we can connect, and then I get that follow-up a week later when you've had a good night's sleep? I'm sitting here nodding at you saying, <laughs> yes, you can avoid them. If that's not your thing, please don't do it. Yeah. Right. Because it will be painful for everybody. I like the fact that you, have, you are really thinking about what's my next point of contact. So if you do get up to that front of the line, if you do it at all, I'm going to tell you get there really early or stay really late. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be there in the middle because that's what it's just, you know, <laughs> cattle call. call. The that's, stay late was an phrase. old reporter trick I used to do. Is and that it, right? it, it, it kept me at work longer, but I would hang out at the political thing after she'd spoken and all the people, other reporters had done their thing. You know, I'd sort of look for that sigh and then you move in. Right, you know, yeah, like you a, nail a, them a right shark, when they're you know. like they're on their back, on their but, back. But do you figure out a nice opening and then mm -hmm. you can get a conversation instead of the rat a tat tat? And that probably works in any situation. And it's great. And you know, if you're really there at the end of the day and there's a company you're targeting, you might offer to help them pack up their boxes. Wow. And really just get in a conversation with wow. them. Wow. Yeah. Oh, right? I'm like, that is amazing. <laughs> I never thought of that. And all of a sudden you're just there saying, oh, it must have been a really long day for you. You know, how many people did you talk to? And really talk to them as a human being rather than somebody yeah. who's trying to approach for a job. See, I think that that's, the, I think that the, the onus is on you to not make it about you, actually. Mm -hmm. so if you turn the tables and yeah. say, uh, you know, you know, it just seems so hard what you're doing. I came here to, like, try to convince you that I want to work for you, but that looks really hard what you just did. How was that? <laughs> yeah. You know, and I wonder how people, like, but I think that that's an off-putting thing when someone's not asking me for something and all of a sudden says, how are you or how mm -hmm. are you feeling and just waits it's not a bad thing. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act when you're at those things because they see there's a long line. <laughs> and they don't see the bathroom break coming anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So they have to balance between getting into a chatty conversation. Oh, by the way, bathroom breaks, really good. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well. Um, the bar, all that good stuff. Uh, the food line. But, you know, you have all those other people behind you that are going to start to groan if you just start to get into a conversation. So uh, you, you can do that a little, but... You really need to have some quick purpose. And maybe it's, you know, I know you've got a long line of people here. I want to introduce myself and, and have a moment to, you know, just get a quick bit of information. And then maybe we could follow up when it's not so crowded for you. And make it about, hey, I'm doing it for you, as my grandmother would say. Um, 
I have a couple of last questions so um, that we have to get to. Stephen Dallas says, I have been lucky enough to find jobs in this difficult market. I enjoy the thrill of working on the new job. Mm. But then an element of boredom, boredom creeps in after 12 to 18 months. And how can someone like that network in an organization? You don't want to say, that. oh, I'm bored with this company. <laughs> but what can you do to network in your own yes. organization? I love that question. And and uh, was it Steve? Steve and Dallas. Steve, I feel you. I never lasted in a job more than three years uh, that I didn't start my own company because I got bored really easily. And so one of the things I want to tell you is to network internally. I want you to go talk to some of the gatekeepers, some of the uh, the receptionists and the uh, the secretaries or the you know find out what people are working on and what gets you interested. You know what? Forfeit your lunch break and ask to just sit in on a meeting or shadow somebody for a little while and, and learn a little bit about the different jobs that are there so that you can think about what opportunities you're looking for. And so you have to be aware that when you are doing this, it is in a way a transition. So nine to five isn't there anymore because anything that you're trying to learn is going to be above and beyond what you already have to do. Because in order for them to want to invest in you, you have to show the productivity at what you're already doing. Mm. But if you are doing that and then you're putting that extra time into volunteer for a recruiting committee or, uh, you know, a, a woman's network or whatever it might be, you are now broadening your exposure and that familiarity. Right. And so then you can kind of pick people's brains about what's going on and say, you know, I'm really curious about that. Can I help you? You know, I'll be happy to do it off hours. Interesting. Uh, this is a fascinating one from Caitlin. Ready for this? Most of our clients come to us after being unsuccessful in their job search. When we ask what methods they are using, their answer is typically applying online using Monster, Career Builder, Craigslist, et cetera. What are your suggestions for helping to change the mi their mindset from applying online to networking? Caitlin is a professional resume writer. Hmm. So she's getting all these people who are saying, help me with my resume. <laughs> da, da, da. And she's saying, how do I get these people to stop just using the internet and start doing face-to-face -face networking? What are, what are some of the tips she can give them? Um, there's two things that come to mind there. One is that instead of working on the resume, help them work on the cover letter. Mm. I will tell you I've hired people based on a cover letter. If you really make it personal and why in that first sentence or two you are talking with them, what was so compelling about the job, show your energy and your excitement and your enthusiasm in that cover letter and you might get your foot in the door. Mm. And so if you are having to go that online route, that cover letter matters. It matters. But how do we shift that? Because especially with the younger generation, yeah. of which I, I feel like I'm not a part of anymore. You're not. <laughs> but we're but we're beyond, <laughs> well beyond we're not. <laughs> uh, you know, face to face, this art of the conversation has really been lost. And there's so much that people get from a communication in the visual that yeah. they're not going to get. The the most uh, I would say lacking intimacy or <laughs> it's that's probably not the right word. But you get nothing from an email. You have no tone. You have no intonation. You have no expression. You have no way to know anything about them. And so if you talk to somebody, and she's talking to some of her clients, ask them questions around what they think some of their best traits are and how do they get them across. Hmm. And they're going to give answers that need you to be in person. And so they're going to start recognizing on their own, so what are your opportunities to show people all of those strengths and all of those great qualities? They have to come to their own conclusion. Yeah. You can hit them over the head with it, but until they make the connection of those dots, they won't do it. I, I would say she should also tell them to go cold turkey on the computer. I mean, tell <laughs> really? them that they have to spend eight hours oh. tomorrow networking. Maybe I'll give them email and Facebook, but only for the purpose of setting up those face-to-face -face meetings. Right, you need because, that. Because you see people, they fall back. It's so easy to apply mm -hmm. for a job online, frankly. Right. You know, there's no personal contact. Yeah, you probably don't even know. You can't even be specific in the cover letter because you don't know the people. Mm -hmm. And force them, say, you know, you, all you're going to spend the next day doing is making lunch dates, getting in touch with people, having these networking conversations you're talking about absolutely nothing else but you have to spend the entire day doing all this you know it's interesting it's tough you know I, I like the idea of uh, setting some type of strategic plan in terms of yeah. the actions that you'll take but sometimes if you make it too much then we'll we'll chicken away so what if we blend it what if we take this gold go cold turkey okay and set up some phone some face-to-face -face, and um, once you hit five, you can have a break. Right, you get, <laughs> you know? now you get your Facebook time. Yeah. Right, then you can. And so if we kind of mix it up a little right. bit, and if you've talked to somebody or emailed with them three times, the next move is let's see if we can get it on the phone. I always ask clients who email me, and they, they'll often say I prefer an email. So I'll always respond as they prefer, and then I'll say, 
perhaps an introductory phone call would help us, you know, solidify your objectives. And it is easier to talk it than it is oh, to write I think it. So. And also what they need to remember is that they think that the direct route is the best. So applying for that job is the best. When actually, you know, as you say, 90% of executive positions are not filled because you mm -hmm. went to that lunch knowing the position you wanted. It's the fact that you had that lunch and then a day, a month, a year later, mm -hmm. that pays off when, oh, this position opened up. I know that person, blah, blah, That's, blah. So, it's true. so just, just mm -hmm. have lunch with people you used to work with. Right. Um, you know, the, your job is not to actually necessarily, maybe the goal isn't like, I need to get a job. It's you make that goal something that's much more achievable, which is I need to get those three lunches scheduled or these three exactly. meetings scheduled. And then it's like a diet. It's like you don't want to say, I want to lose 50 pounds. It's like, you know what? Actually, what I want to do is I want to lose three pounds in the next two weeks. And let's try to do mm -hmm. little baby steps first. And so if we are doing the baby steps and it's hard to get them going cold turkey off the computer, what I want them to do instead of applying for the job is when they find the job, go on to LinkedIn and search your network for somebody yeah. who might have a connection to that industry right. or that organization. And then keep searching the network and then contact them for information. Can I have five minutes of your time just to ask what you might think or what they might be looking for? So you're not asking for anything more than a few minutes of information so that you might write that more powerful cover letter. Right. And so um, you might then get the introduction or you might get an informational interview. And before you actually apply for the job, you might do a lot of that. And then all of a sudden you're actually standing in the company's <laughs> offices. Yeah and you're talking to the receptionist, and maybe you have that application in the back pocket, and you say, you know what, I put this together, is anybody I can actually hand it to? Yeah, That's yeah, not exactly. bad, yeah. I like that. And Because <laughs> getting the human to hand someone a resume, I mean, it's so different than something cold landing on my desk, and yeah. someone I know, you know, someone like Jill, handing it to me and saying, this person's great, you're like, whoa, I'm gonna talk um, to that person. Just one last, Regal Resume says, great suggestions. Stats say that only 4 to 10% of people applying using online application methods are successful. 4 yeah. to 10%. Doesn't That's amazing. Me. That's totally amazing. Uh, actually, 10 actually sounds high to me. Yeah, yeah. I actually thought, I would have said 2. Yeah. 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 2 to 6%. So, yeah. so we got to get everyone to build their networks. Um, if you would like more information about Michelle's book, let me just put it up there. Do we have a picture of that that we can put somewhere? The 11 Laws of Likeability. We'll get you a picture. Um, that would be good. Um, are men better at social networking than women? It's a fascinating question. I often get the gender questions. I actually think women, and I might be a little bit uh, biased, but I think women are better. <laughs> because one of um, one of our bloggers, who um, Amy Levin Epstein writes this job blog, and she said that a study found men are better that social at social networking than women, and I found that to be. Me too. Because I right? was like, really? It just didn't seem, I don't know, maybe it's like it's a study, so it can be there's just one study, that um, there are more men than women on LinkedIn. Hmm. Okay, but that's LinkedIn. I, I women connect in different ways also. That's my point, and that's why I would have leaned towards women being better at it, because they are broader in the way in which they think about networking and the things they're willing to talk about and connect on. So I'm curious about the definition of better. Yeah, right. Exactly. It may just be more and my wife's the one who tells me what my friends are doing on Facebook. Oh, your brother just did this. Oh, your buddy in Vermont just did it. Really? See? Oh, okay. That, Thanks, I mean, honey. I think that, that it's just uh, it, there's a different way that, that women connect. It was funny. So before we go, I'll just tell you a funny story is that I was talking to somebody in financial services, and they were talking about how marketing to their marketing plans, and they want to talk about how to market differently to women than to men. And mm -hmm. I said, oh, you're finally catching on. I said, well, let me tell you something. Having a 55-year-old white guy in a commercial is not a great way to market <laughs> to women who have money. It's just not. It's not. It's just not. And it's like a yep. turnoff in a weird way. And putting some hot 28-year-old in the same ad, also not that interesting to yeah, women no. who are in their 40s. That, you yeah. know, they say, like, I want women in their 40s who have money. I'm like, not a great targeting campaign. I don't know. Like, guys think that that's awesome. Like, she's a hot chick. Everyone wants to be hot. If you're I'll a woman, you want to be hot? Right. Not going to work. Yeah. And they say 80% of financial decisions are made by women. Thank God. Finally, <laughs> the, the wiser, wiser sex rules. Michelle Tillis Letterman. You got it. The founder and CEO of Executive Essentials, the author of 11 Laws of Likeability. you got a lot of things. She's a professor. She's da, da, da. Go buy her book. It's very interesting. Um, and I think that a really interesting approach to uh, making the word networking not seem so scary and disgusting, because yeah. I know that that has that. <laughs> yeah. I never call it, again, schmoozing. Schmoozing. schmoozing making schmoozing. friends. We're going to have building a little bit of coffee talk. All right. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for watching. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks Michelle. for having me on the show. Jack Otter, thank you so much for joining us. Great on the to show. be here, as always. As always. Thank you for watching, and uh, we'll see you next week for Ask the Experts at MoneyWatch.com. Sally, cue the music. <laughs>